The legislature is considering a 19% cut to the Human Services Department's Behavioral Health Division, and that adds up to about $8 million. And as we discussed last week, some of those costs would shift over to Medicaid. Behavioral health service providers and community advocates have been raising concerns about those proposed cuts, and they've been trying to get lawmakers to pay attention to the challenges people face trying to access services across the state. Generation Justice provides journalism and social justice training for young people. And over the past year, Generation Justice producers interviewed clients, providers, and community leaders who are concerned about access to quality behavioral health services. They also worked with 24 partners to help distribute the media they created and support a petition to the New Mexico legislature. Our producer, Sarah Gustavus, sat down recently with a Generation Justice fellow and local expert to learn more about the project. I lost my father to suicide six years ago, so I found my passion or my purpose in life out of the tragedy of losing my dad. We're very Hispanic and we don't like to talk about being sick. We don't want to say we have a problem. We all are perfectionist. I live with bipolar disorder. I have been psychotic at least five times. The psychotic mind would not want me to hurt myself. So I did, I took an overdose of medications and then out of total fear, I drove to the hospital and one block from the hospital I had an accident and you know, a higher power was with me because I did not cause any severe injuries. I'm just so grateful I didn't hurt anybody. That was my major concern. I'd probably say the biggest barrier here in New Mexico is a cultural barrier. Struggling with multiple mental health diagnoses in this kind of cultural environment that's very figure it out on your own and do it yourself. I think that mentality has been the hardest thing to get rid of. I'm here at the table today with Christina Rodriguez, a fellow with Generation Justice. Thanks for joining us. Thank you for having me. Also, Fred Sandoval, your operations manager for the National Latino Behavioral Health Association. Thanks for being here. It's great to be here. Fred, you have decades of experience working in behavioral health, both at the local and national level. Are things getting better or worse in New Mexico? Well, you can measure that several different ways. Um, one way you can measure that is you could try to look at some of the past data that tells us how have we fared. And if you look at two reports that were done that studied the states across the country, it's called Grading the States, uh, New Mexico scored a, a C minus in 2006. And then years later, when it was measured again, I suppose, graded 2009, it was measured at a C. So you see we kind of fit in the middle of the pack. And so there has certainly been enough changes since 2009 to show that with those recent changes, uh, we probably have uh, fared well in some areas and not in others. So where we would land on the grade just depends on how the evaluation is done. But uh, there are some issues and concerns to be uh, paid attention to about you know, how well we're doing. Now, a lot of people follow the closing of some behavioral health providers. There's was an investigation. It's kind of an ongoing thing in the state right now. How has that impacted availability of services to people this year in 2016? Well, what happens is that when there are major shifts of that sort, and these are significant shifts, anytime there's a provider who is no longer in existence, it's an immediate impact. There are transition plans, obviously, to address that. But the reality is that it's one thing for the provider to transition and be prepared. It's the impact on the consumers and the families that actually is significantly altered. It breaks the trust relationship. It breaks the established relationship with those agencies. It has long-term effects, uh, and to deny that would be uh, something that we need to pay attention to. Where it is that we are in terms of things today, I think it really speaks to the fact that there's a constant transition, constant change, lots of adjustments. That's a stressful environment for anyone, whether you're on the provider side, the, the families that are impacted by this, and the observations of the community, and then ultimately what the health status of New Mexicans are. And all you have to do is look at the health status of New Mexicans in terms of behavioral health conditions, and I can tell you, we're not faring that well. So that means as no matter what service systems are in place, how are we actually doing though? How well are we doing? Uh, and you look at the data around suicide issues, for instance, hospitalization, the list goes on. I would simply say uh, our behavioral health is not well. So we really have to temper up and treat our system so we can actually make some improvements with it. Now lawmakers are looking at money right now and funding mm -hmm. for behavioral health potential cuts. Governor Martinez said in her State of the State address on opening day of the legislative session this year that we've seen an 84% increase in behavioral health services. Does that number ring true to you? 
I would simply say this about data. Uh, one is when you pick one number and isolate it and keep treat it in isolation, you don't see the full picture. So it's really important for us to really say, let's look at that data in comparison to what has happened in the last 10 years. So we can actually see 85% from where. Uh, so if you've been at this level and then you see this 2,000% decline and then all of a sudden it goes up 85%, well, you could certainly say it's actually uh, gone up from a certain point. I think the data, when you look at it singularly like this, could be problematic. I would simply say, let's look at all, all of the data and let's have some transparent data that really tells us what has been happening. And the issue around data is the significant perennial problem in the public sector about what do we really know about the data? And I would simply say is we probably need to re-examine numbers very carefully. Mm. Numbers are important, but people's stories are also really significant here, Christina. Generation Justice interviewed providers, clients, people talking about where things stand for them right now, their experience trying to access service or provide services. What did you hear from people in these videos that you did? I mean, exactly. We looked at all the data, we looked at the statistics, and as a young person, just understanding the vocabulary, the process, and going through all of that, that was eye-opening enough to realize that, you know, like the system needs healing just like the people need healing. And then going through the interview process, we just noticed all of these trends of having a hard time just trying to get an appointment, just trying to get a diagnosis to start off with, or driving three hours to the nearest provider. And just hearing those stories you share, like this laughter or like their silence, like you share all of these different emotions with each other when you're actually having that conversation. And it, it brings life to the situation because when you're reading all the numbers, although that gives you the grand picture and that can lead to you know policy change, when you hear it yourself, it, it changes inside you and in your heart and your perspective. And like I didn't anticipate that I would be here speaking out mm -hmm. about this problem, but their stories have motivated me that you know, I need to find my strength and utilize the platform of media in order to really tell their stories and to shine light on what they are experiencing in the system. Any particular stories that really have resonated with you, maybe you're telling other people yeah. about or that you keep coming back to in your own mind? Exactly. My first interview I did was with Valerie Romero and she was from Casa de Corazon and she told me resiliency is no excuse for abuse and that just kind of echoed in my head throughout all of the interviews I did from there on out because it depends on how you really view the system and what you know the healthcare should provide but I really do think that the system needs to be changed like we need to have comprehensive integrated services we need multicultural services we need services for young people LGBTQ people and it really needs to encompass what our society looks like and mirror us. And I think just that line that resiliency is no excuse for abuse. Like, of course, you can navigate the system, you can figure out your way of how to get the care that you need, but I think for New Mexico that we can do better. And what's the message you're taking to lawmakers now by wanting them to watch these videos and talking about the issues that you covered in, in the project? Yeah, we, we tried to create this space where the people that told their stories would have the platform for those stories to actually be heard. So sending those videos to legislatures on a, to legislators on a daily basis, making sure that they have access to that information of what their policies are actually creating for our daily lives of our family members, of the people we go to school with, and of ourselves. And so we're just encouraging them that we are in a behavioral health crisis right now, and change can't be put off on a timeline. It can't wait until next year. Like it needs to happen now. And again, just comprehensive and integrated services that, you know, when something does go wrong, that people know who to talk to and that that doesn't just get lost. People don't fall through the cracks. Fred, it's not often that we hear people talking about their personal stories. There's a lot of stigma around behavioral health and right. substance abuse. But you have a personal story. You have siblings who struggled with these issues. How does that impact your work? Great question. Uh, I feel very passionate about this subject, by the way. Uh, behavioral health is in all of our lives. Um, there are those of us who like to talk about it. And we like to talk about it because we're interested in being better, healing, and really remedying the past because we all struggle with issues, just the nature of life. This is across all, all sectors of our population. Uh, my sister was diagnosed with chronic paranoid schizophrenia and was actually discharged from the U.S. Army as a young woman. And uh, so in her early 20s, um, she was discharged because of her medical condition. And that psychotic break ended up leading to the present day situation where she's at, still uh, dealing with the issues of schizophrenia. And having watched my older sister, who was about a year and a half older than I am, struggle, as I said to President Bush some years back, I got to watch her three lives. Her life before she was ever 
troubled by schizophrenia, the life where she was untreated, suffering from schizophrenia, and then her life now in recovery of dealing with those issues. Watching her struggle, especially for those 10 years, it was very traumatic. Um, what I can recall about that experience for me personally is that how her, our paths crossed in a very different way. So while we're siblings, it's our family, it's an intimate relationship, uh, to see her struggle was just so painful. She actually was referred to my community mental health center where I was the director. She was admitted to our transitional living program, which no longer exists, by the way, uh, even though it could and should and would benefit many people just like her. But it was her first time to have a stable living environment as opposed to being in jails, uh, state hospitals, emergency rooms on the street, and multiple apartments. She'd been sexually assaulted many times and uh, suffered tremendous losses. Just a tragic situation, which I shared with the president, just so he would know is treatment doesn't mean that you have access to it. And the end result was this, is that we were able to get her in a long-term care facility that provided her boarding home care. And she's been there for years, different units, but the stability has been enormous. Uh, it's great to have conversations with her about where things are at now, but she suffers from that mental illness. And then a brother who died from alcoholism. Mm -hmm. So yeah, this stuff is very personal to me, but at a professional level, it's influenced and informed me about what we can do better. Because I found where the system failed her, it's not where the system failed my brother, and what their role was within that. And so rather than blaming families, it was about, oh, there's something that we could do different with the system, the way we provide services and what services are missing. And in some regards, um, we've made some improvements, but there are many areas that, quite frankly, mean people fall through the gaps and there are people who are hurting, and the data proves that. Christina, what's at stake if the legislature cuts funding for behavioral health services this year? I mean, I just think it creates a ripple effect throughout society. You know, like this isn't a partisan issue. Like this is something that affects everybody. And like you said, that's what our petition has been to try and create that dialogue, to try and actually show like what people are experiencing right now with the lack of resources that hi historically New Mexico has faced when it comes to behavioral health and how devastating it would be just to have more money taken away. Like, in order to see all of our videos and our petition that we created, we use the hashtag NM Speaks Crisis, and we also have generationjustice.org slash NM Speaks. And on there, we got at least 2,000 signatures, but we got 400 comments, which I really wasn't expecting, of people sharing their really intimate stories of what is happening to them and how they feel like no one's listening and they don't know who to go to because when something that traumatic happens to you or something that personal, that intimacy, how do you share that on a political level to create change? And I think that creating a dialogue itself to really show the human aspect of what's going on is hopefully gonna get through to the politicians to make change too. There's so much more that we could talk about. We're gonna end it there for this week. We look forward to having you both back in the future. Thanks, Sarah. Thank you. Thank you.